a chapter I'm determined to complete today. Too many laughed at that. Well, let's open in prayer and read the entire section and then pick up where we left off. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth so long ago and died on Calvary for our sins. And for those who believe in him, a glorious future awaits and we're studying this glorious return, a, turn, a return with great violence followed by a perfect kingdom of peace through the Prince of Peace. We come worshiping Him today. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Verse 11, John says, I saw heaven opened. So he's looking at a future event that will come. And behold, a white horse and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, come assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the, the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. <clears throat> so last time we left off in verse 15, actually the middle of verse 15, which the verse says, from his mouth, that's Jesus' mouth, comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So in verse 13, we saw that Jesus is this great warrior wearing a robe dipped in blood. In verse 15, he specifically treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. This imagery of judgment looks back to Revelation 14. Let's do a quick review there. Turn back to Revelation 14, 14 through 20. <clears throat> Revelation 14:14 14, 14 says, "Then I looked and behold a white cloud. And sitting on this cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand." So the description in verse 14 here looks back to Daniel 7:13 and 14, the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the son of man, the Messianic king who will come and rule the earthly kingdom of God. So Daniel 7, 13 and 14 uh, picks up with Jesus here, the one like a son of man in Revelation 14, 14, and he's the one coming back on the white horse in Revelation 19 to rule as king. So using an agricultural metaphor, Jesus has a sickle in his hand. I don't know if do any of you use sickles in harvesting anymore and and we just got John Deere tractors, right? Well, they used sickles back then to harvest, but this is a judgment harvest on the earth that will happen before he establishes his kingdom. Verse 15, and another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. 
Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who, now, we know the earth, the vegetation has been destroyed, right? Now, when, when you look at the, the tribulation period, the judgment on the earth itself gets terrible, and it gets worse and worse as the tribulation progresses. So is this a reference to a lot of ripe crops on the earth? Of course not. The judgment is on people. So he took the one who sat on the cloud, that's Jesus, swung his sickle over the entire earth, and the earth was reaped. So when this angel comes out of the heavenly temple to announce this judgment harvest of the Messiah, who then swings the sickle to the earth to reap judgment. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. So the Son of Man had a sharp sickle, and now another angel does as well. Verse 18, then another angel, so this is now the third angel to appear in the passage, another angel who had the power over fire came out from the altar and he called out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, I think to the angel of verse 17, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Now this word ripe in the Greek language in verse 18 is akmadzo. Akmadzo means to ripen. It can even be, uh, it can be translated to be in one's prime. So the time of judgment is ready. The earth is prime for judgment. So verse 19, so the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the great wrath of God. It's all metaphorical with the winepress. So we've looked at the wine press in past studies, <clears throat> Revelation 19.15 and also Revelation 14.19 speak of this great wine press, wine press of the wrath of God. So these were very common in ancient Israel. Uh, they were carved out of limestone bedrock and they would trod the grapes, as you, I don't know if you can see it, I tried to blow that up as much as I could, but they trod the grapes by foot on the treading floor there at the top of the screen. And there are this, these little openings that would go to the vats. So the grape juice would pour into the vat through that channel, and they'd often filter these channels with press thorns or plant fiber materials for their filter. And you clearly see the analogy. The treading of the grapes is a picture of God treading judgment on people. And the red grape juice squeezed out is analogous to the blood that's poured out of those being judged. Very strong metaphor. So the imagery of the sickle harvest and the wine press of God's wrath is found in Old Testament passages like uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and even Joel. We've looked at those in great detail, but I'm going to continue to return to this one. Go to Isaiah 50, sorry, Isaiah 63. <clears throat> this one has one of the best connections to this judgment in Revelation 14 and also Revelation 19. And you'll see the clear imagery revealed by God through a prophet who lived 700 years before Jesus' first advent. So this was prophesied. And it was a prediction of Messiah's victory as king over his enemies. However, this will be fulfilled, not at the first coming, it didn't happen, it will be the second advent. I hear pages turning, I'll wait. That means I, I, wanna, I don't want to get ahead of you. Everybody there? Everybody there? I mean, are you with me? <laughs> Isaiah 63, 1. Um, Isaiah has a question that starts the verse. Who is this one who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, what is he dressed as? He's a king. He's a ruler. Doesn't Jesus come back as king of kings, lord of lords? And notice, marching in the greatness of his strength, so he's coming as a powerful warrior. Well, the Lord answers that question. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So the Lord says that he speaks in righteousness. 
He's a righteous God. Jesus returns in righteousness, right? Revelation 19, 11, we just read it. John said, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it who's called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. That's the imagery back in Isaiah 63 in prophecy. And notice Isaiah 63 verse 1 says that he's what? Mighty to, to save. We talk about Jesus as a mighty savior at the cross, but this isn't the cross. It's Rav Lahoshia. Rav in Hebrew is something that means abundant, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Varav chesed va'emet, that's God, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Then we have Rav here for something like great, uh, mighty. Uh, some Bibles translate it great to deliver. So the salvation spoken of here is Messiah's ability to deliver or save Israel from their enemies and bring them out of the battle into the promised land. I mean, what were, remember the book of Judges? The Shofatim, they were judges. But what did they do for Israel? They saved Israel. Read Judges 2. They were saviors or deliverers. So they delivered them from the hand of the Philistines like Samson or from the hand of the enemy. Jesus is the ultimate uh, judge who comes back judging and waging war, who delivers Israel from their enemies. And he'll bring them into the promised land. So this idea of salvation being this final restoration in the land and the kingdom, Isaiah 56, 1, Joel 2, 28 through 32, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Romans eleven twenty six, Hebrews 1, 14, Hebrews 9, 28. All these talk about that future salvation of Messiah bringing Israel into the kingdom. So Jesus comes at his second advent as a victorious king warrior who will rule after judgment. Um, I like this passage in Zephaniah 3.17. When's the last time you read Zephaniah? This is a passage dealing with Messiah's rule in his earthly kingdom in the future. And it says, the Lord your God is in your midst. And what does it call him? A Gabor Yoshia, a victorious warrior. Or you could put a warrior or mighty one who saves. That's what it says in Isaiah 63. So Jesus is a warrior who delivers. And what will he do after he puts Israel in the land? He, the Messiah, will exult over you with joy. He'll be quiet in his love and will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Well, Deuteronomy 30 says when Israel's restored in their land, the Lord will have compassion over his people and rejoice over them. So that will one day be fulfilled. And you have Gabor Yoshia. Yoshia comes from the word Yasha. You ever heard of Yasha to save in Hebrew? What is Jesus called by the Messianic Jews? Yeshua, the noun, Savior, salvation. So Jesus is a mighty warrior who will deliver Israel. So back to Isaiah 2 and 63, 2 and 3. So Isaiah has another question. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? Okay, we've seen the winepress. Revelation 14, Revelation 19, those two chapters. Well, the Lord answers that question. He says, I've trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there is no man with me. I also trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath. So there's the wrath, the wine press of the wrath of God the Almighty. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. And notice in verse 3, it says the Messiah defeats the enemy all by himself, single-handedly. I've trodden the wine trough alone. And the Hebrew bod is a word for alone or by itself. And the red juice from the grapes that stains his garments is analogous to the blood of his enemies that splatters on him during the judgment. So verse 4. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. 
So they say there's a, a mean Jesus in the Old Testament, but a nice one in the New. Ever heard that? No judgment in the New. Well, the New Testament will fulfill this judgment. Back to that later. So the year of my redemption has come. That's at the second coming of Christ. Jesus spoke prophetically of this at his first advent. Luke 21, 28, talking about the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation to come, he says, when these things begin to take place, he tells the disciples, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Well, Isaiah 63, 4 will be fulfilled at that time. So since Christ was rejected at his first advent, that redemption didn't come, not the nation Israel into the kingdom. So that will be fulfilled at the second advent when he returns on the white horse. Joel also uses the imagery of the wine press, the prophet Joel. Joel 3, 12 and 13, let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit in, in judgment on all the surrounding nations, God says. Isn't that what's happening? The, the nations have assembled against Jesus when he returns on the white horse to fight his army. Verse 13, put in the sickle, <clears throat> for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. It's like the winepress being full of grapes. It's really full of wickedness. It needs to be oppressed and shut down. So the fighting in the valley of Jehoshaphat and the sickle harvest is actually stage seven of the Armageddon campaign that we've looked at. When the fighting starts at Basra and then moves toward Jerusalem, where it ends in the valley of Jehoshaphat. This parallels Revelation 14, 14 through 20, where we are. This will be followed by the victory ascent of Jesus to the Mount of Olives that will split in two, and then Israel will go into the land. Joel 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So the valley of decision is the valley of Jehoshaphat from verse 2 and also verse 12, which, you know what Jehoshaphat means? Yahweh judges. What an appropriate name. It's exactly what he's going to do. Verse 15, the sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars lose their brightness the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. This all reminds me of Psalm 2 and also Psalm 110. Psalm 2 closes with, blessed are those who take refuge in him. And that's Jesus coming back to establish his kingdom and defeat the enemies in Psalm 2 as well. So now the last verse in Revelation 14. Did I have you leave Revelation 14? I'm sorry. My job is to say, hold a place here and then go there. Well, back to Revelation 14. The last verse in that section, still dealing with the wine press. The wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles. For a distance of 200 miles. So the wine press pictures this battle zone for the campaign of Armageddon in the future tribulation, which we're not a part of yet. Uh, yet I'm not going to say yet. We won't be a part of it. We'll be raptured, but the tribulation is still future. And so outside the city is outside Jerusalem in verse 20. And verse 20 says, The blood comes up to the bridles of the horse which indicates the blood splatter, I think, goes that high. Just like when you step on grapes in a wine press, it splatters up, just like it does on Christ's robe when he returns to beat the enemy. Some just take it as hyperbole for the terrible bloodshed at that time. And it extends for a distance of 1,600. you have furlongs in any Bible? Furlongs? Uh, a furlong translates the Greek stadion which is about 607 feet, so they estimate 183.9 miles. So this tremendous bloodshed extends for approximately 200 miles. So the whole area that day will be turned into this horrible, violent battle zone 
when Jesus returns from heaven and destroys the armies of the Antichrist. <clears throat> so verse 16 of Revelation 19. Let's move over there. And on his robe, this is Jesus' robe as he returns on the white horse. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, back in chapter 17, it spoke of the enemies of the Messiah waging war against the Lamb. The Lamb is Christ, who is described with the same title, just in reverse order. Just uh, flip back to Revelation 17, 14. Keep your place here, but... In Revelation 17, 14, it says, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, so He's victorious in the battle, because He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. I mean, if He's the ultimate sovereign living God, how could you defeat Him? And those who are with Him are called, are, excuse me, are the called and the chosen and the faithful. So some argue that the armies that come back with Jesus on the white horse have to be human because this refers to called people called, or chosen people and faithful people. It doesn't deny angels will return as well. Other passages indicate that. Now I'm going to throw something here at you because if I don't put this up here, somebody will say, why didn't you use this one? I love that. Y'all are so sharp. You don't want to miss anything. So the title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, shows up in 1 Timothy. Now, this one's a little tricky. Is this, is this God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit? Well, 1 Timothy 6.13. Where's Danny? Hey, I'm in your same chapter on the, on the bonus reading for integrity. Okay. Okay. Um, Verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God. I think that's God the Father in context. Why? Because of what else it says. Who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus. See, there's God the Son. Who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate at his trial, at his first advent. That you keep the commandments without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in inapproachable light, unapproachable light, excuse me, who no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Now, most take the words of this passage to be words that just simply give praise to the God of glory, who is described as the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. You could just say it's a general description of God and leave it there, but could it be the Father or the Son? <clears throat> well, by application, they're all three members of the Godhead. But is Paul being directed by the Spirit to write about a specific member of the Trinity? So even if it's a description of God in general, or even a reference to God the Father, and some will go with the Father here because no man has seen Him or can see Him. And what did John 1.18 say? No man has seen God, but they did see the Son. The, the Son of God was the visible manifestation of the Godhead when God became flesh. Could be the Father. Either way, this description of God and the fact that Jesus bears these, this exact title in Revelation 17 and also Revelation 19 shows that these characteristics of sovereignty and eternal deity belong to Him as well. Amen? And other passages are very clear that Jesus is God. So in Revelation 19 and these other passages, Jesus is described as the greatest king of all using what language calls as a superlative to indicate something's the highest. 
Remember in the temple and the tabernacle, there was a holy place? What was behind that veil? The holy of holies. That's a superlative. The greatest, the most holy place of all. You ever heard of the Song of Solomon? The book? Yes. Are you all with me? I asked that earlier. Well, in Hebrew, that's Shir HaSharim. Shir is a song, but if you say Hir hashir, Shir HaSharim, that's the song of songs. Superlative. So here Jesus is described as the king of kings, the king above all kings, no one greater, the Lord of lords. He's the greatest Lord over all things. What was interesting, some scholars have suggested that the doubling of the name of Jesus in such a way would have spoken to the Gentile nations and really against their earthly rulers. Listen to what Dr. Robert Thomas said. He said, the doubling of the name king of kings was a practice of the Persians and the Parthians to emphasize the supremacy of their royalties. John courageously adopts this device in spite of comparable claims of the Roman emperor responsible for his exile. And who was that? D Domitian. He exiled John to the island of Patmos, who evidently made claims that he is the superior, the king of kings. Well, now John, by the Spirit, writes that, no, Jesus is. He goes on to say, the Messiah alone has a rightful claim to the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as the Bible will demonstrate, only God has the right to rule, and Jesus will be that ruler on earth. So Jesus is sovereign Lord incarnate, and when he returns at his second advent, he'll rule as the supreme king over the greatest kingdom mankind has ever known, to say the least. So back to Revelation 19, we come to the judgment supper of God. And who's on the dinner plate? The enemy. It's actually a part of bold judgment number seven. Remember the series of judgments? You had the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The seven bowls were the last set and the worst. So I think this is going back to that judgment bowl number seven when Jesus comes back to end the Armageddon War. So there's two suppers in this chapter, remember? The first supper is in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, which is the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's a good one, right? But then you have the judgment supper of God, Revelation 19, 17 and following. So now we come to supper number two. <clears throat> Verse 17 says, when I, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and all the flesh of men, both free men and slaves, small and great. So this elect angel of God announces the great judgment supper of God. He summons the birds of the sky to assemble for this feast on the dead bodies of the enemies of God, which include unsaved people from all walks of life. You see it? Kings, commanders, mighty men, even free men, slaves, small and great. So unbelievers come in all categories. Now, what's interesting, you may say, okay, birds feasting on the bodies, but that is a, a biblical concept elsewhere. Birds feasting on the bodies of the dead is found in Old Testament as a picture of God's judgment on Israel for their sin and covenant violation. Remember, Deuteronomy 28 has two major sections. The first 14 verses describe God's blessing on Israel if they obey Him as a nation. Verses 15 through 68 describe God's judgment on Israel if they sin. And look how He likened it. We did some of this in the first hour with the enemies of, of the nations coming against them. But look how God described the cursing section on Israel, or one verse out of it, if Israel continues to sin against God. <clears throat> verse 26, your carcasses will be food to the birds of the sky 
and to the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. In other words, I'm going to judge you, and, and death can come to you, and the car, the, your carcasses will just be for, food for the birds. So when you read this in Revelation 19, you're like, I've seen this imagery. So if Israel obeys God, they're blessed, but if they disobey, this is part of the curse in such harsh language. So did Israel listen to this in Deuteronomy 28? No, they failed. So you get to the time of Jeremiah later. Israel will follow into this idolatry that is so abominable, they actually offer their own children to the fiery furnaces of Molech, which I think we're doing similar things today in our culture and all this trafficking and all that's going on and what's happening to these children. Uh, it's just this, and I think there's idolatry attached to it. But Israel would fall into this, God's own people, and start worshiping false gods and even sacrificing their own children. So what did God say in Jeremiah 7, 32 and 33? For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth because there's no other place. The dead bodies of this people, uh, that's Israel, the Jews who've practiced this stuff, will be food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth. Covenant violation, covenant judgment, Deuteronomy 28. And there will be no one to frighten them away. Same language, isn't it? So you go to Jeremiah 12, 9. So, so again, why did Israel go into the 70 years of Babylonian captivity? Idolatry and the worst kind. When you start sacrificing your own children, you've hit rock bottom and you're digging deeper. Jeremiah 12, 9, is my inheritance, God says, is my inheritance like a speckled bird of prey to me? Are the birds of prey against her on every side? Go, gather all the beasts of the field, bring them to devour. So covenant violation, covenant curse. But what's different about this in Revelation 19? Do you see a difference? Was that rhetorical? Am I really asking you to talk? You can talk. What's different here is that Israel's not being judged. Who's being judged now? The nations are coming under a similar curse that God pronounced on Israel if they sinned. Ah, not now. At the end of the tribulation, we know after coming to faith in Jesus, the nation will then subsequently turn and repentance and in covenant restoration in obedience, which will bring their restoration in the land. So they've done that throughout the tribulation. They've come to faith. Now they're calling on the Lord, and the Lord is going to save them, bring them into the land, but first he'll destroy the enemy, who will then be devoured by their carcasses, will be devoured by the birds of the sky. So listen, I won't have you turn there for time, but Leviticus 26 is also a blessing, cursing section chapter for Israel. So it starts with blessing, goes to the cursing, but look what God says at the end of Leviticus 26, if Israel comes back. Verse 40, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their unfaithfulness which they committed against me, also in their acting with hostility against me, and God says, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they make amends for their iniquity. Isn't that repentance? They've come to faith in Christ. And now they're coming back to loyalty. They've recognized their sin. They're confessing it just like the end of Isaiah. They're confessing all of our sins and righteous, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags in God's sight. We've walked in our sin for a long time. They do that, and then what does Jesus do? Well, verse 20, 2642 is what Jesus will do. Then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Jacob. Or, uh, Abraham, it goes backwards. Sorry, I'm used to it the other way. So what was the covenant? Well, God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they were to be brought into the land. But to enjoy the land blessing, they had to be obedient. 
And then he says that I will remember the land. What land? The United States? Texas? No, Israel. The promised land. Trust me, he's not setting up the kingdom in the United States or in Texas. So when Israel returns, they will be restored. And then the enemies of Israel, the Gentile nations who went against Israel, the unbelievers are going to be eaten by the birds uh, after they're executed by Christ. Is it time for lunch? I mean, this is harsh stuff, isn't it? But you can't, you can't avoid it. It's in the Scripture. We need, to t- we need to teach it. And a lot of pastors will not teach this. They say, well, it doesn't build big churches. People don't want to hear this. It's depressing. Well, it's the Word of God. So you got to preach all of it. You can't cherry pick. And then when we do that, we get a view that there's only a loving God and then this view that there's only a judgmental God and we have no balance. Again, I'll get to that at the end. I keep saying that. So here in um, Matthew, when Jesus gives his Olivet Discourse, I mean, he's preaching some love and love your enemies, love your neighbor, uh, pray for them and so forth. But look what he says in his Olivet Discourse in the same book, judgment. Speaking of uh, the end of the tribulation, the second advent, he says in Matthew 24, 27, and 28, For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, second advent. And then he says simply, where the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Isn't that Revelation 19, put in very summary form? So here in the Greek, uh, the word that Jesus uses for vultures is aitos. This word can mean an eagle or a vulture. Some Bibles have eagle. I think he has the idea of vultures here because vultures eat the dead bodies of dead creatures. Eagles go after life, pray if I'm correct. So think about it. The vultures were unclean animals in the law of Moses. So unclean birds eat the dead bodies of unclean enemies of God, as it were. Verse 19. Excuse me, I have a dry throat and I'm running out of water. I had to get a new bottle. So Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So the beast and the kings of the earth refer to the Antichrist in his ten-nation confederacy who gather their armies to wage war against Christ on the white horse. Um, I have a reference to Revelation 17, 12, and 13. You can just pop back there real quick and I'll read this to you. Revelation 17, 12 says, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. But they'll receive authority as kings with the beast, that's the Antichrist, for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. So we've looked at this from Revelation 13 in great detail, and also repeated all that in Revelation 17. So the gathering of the armies who assemble to oppose God, I think looks back to Psalm 2. Remember, why are the nations in an uproar? They've all assembled against the Lord, and it says the Lord looks down at them and scoffs. He laughs at them, and then Jesus returns and defeats the enemy. So we've looked at that many times, so I will not go back through that in detail. Verse 20, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. By which, he re, uh, sorry, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. So a lot of attention was given to the beast or the antichrist and the false prophet back in Revelation 13. 
So again, the beast is the Antichrist. He's this human world ruler that will rise to power in the future tribulation. So what starts the tribulation clock counting, the seven-year clock, is not the rapture. I think we'll be gone before this tribulation begins, but it's the signing of the treaty with Israel. He'll make a covenant with Israel for how long? One seven, Daniel 9, 27, which is a reference to seven years. In the middle of the seven, he'll stop sacrifice and offerings. So clearly Israel will be back on their temple mount doing sacrifices in some temple at that time. But in the middle of that, he stops the sacrifice and offerings and then begins to persecute Israel for that last three and a half years mercilessly. You can see all this in Revelation 12. He persecutes the woman, which is Israel, the dragon does, for three and a half years. So the beast is this human world ruler that will rise to power in that future day and make this covenant with Israel. Now, could he be alive today? Could be. He could be a little child. He could be an adult. He could be ready to rise to power very soon. Or maybe he's not even born yet. Shall I, you, want, you want me to set a date for you? I will not do that. <laughs> I keep telling him, quit setting dates and then Jesus will come back. Because every time we set a date, he's going, that one's not going to happen for sure now. Kind of kidding about that. But, but it will happen. Is the, and I think the stage is being set up like never before. I think we're getting very close, but I can't tell you when exactly. I, mean, I think things are in place now that have never been in place exactly the same in history. And the, the ability to track everybody the way they can globally and anyway. But then you have this false prophet, which is described as the second beast, Revelation 13, 11 through 18. So he'll arise at that time and do all these miraculous signs to bring glory to the beast, the Antichrist, which is really bringing glory to Satan who indwells the beast. So look at 13, 11. Let's read 13, 11 to the end of the chapter. So verse 11 says, I saw another beast, John does, coming up out of the earth. Now, it could be coming up out of the land. The Greek is possible there. Some think that's why they think this is a Jewish false prophet because the land is the land of Israel. He'll be a Jew that does this. And people say, oh, come on, would, it, would there ever be a false prophet among Israel? <laughs> Did you, have you not read your Old Testament? So I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. This is the false prophet, so the, other, the beast other than him was the Antichrist. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So he has these, calm, these nice characteristics, but he speaks like the devil, right? He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, that would be the Antichrist, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. So he does all these miracles to drive people to worship this anti-Christ. And what did Jesus do? He did miracles to bring glory to God, the Father. His disciples were given miraculous powers to bring glory to Him. Ah, this is an anti-Christ, a substitute Christ who does the opposite and draws this massive population of the world to worship Him. And look where it's going now. You can see it happening now, how easily we're moving this way. So he performed great signs so that even fire comes down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Well, that's what Elijah did, the true prophet of God, to bring glory to God. Counterfeit miracle here. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had his wound of the sword and had come back to life. So I think the Antichrist receives a wound he dies and he comes back to life. Do you think that that's going to be powerful to people when the Antichrist comes back to life? Well, who, who is our Lord who came back to life that we should worship? Jesus Christ, who's alive from the dead. They won't accept that, but they'll accept this, huh? 
So this image that will be set up, they, they're going to worship an image to the beast whose wound was healed. And I think this is going to be set up in the tribulation temple called the abomination of desolation. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24, 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, so it was even in prophecy, he tells them to flee. And I think this abomination of desolation will be set up in the Holy of Holies in that temple they rebuild. Because where would Satan want to put something to desecrate God? Right in the Holy of Holies that they rebuild. Is God worried about that? Oh, he can't handle that, right? He'll let it go on and then he'll stop it. Revelation 13, 15. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So anyone who refuses to worship this false image dies. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead and provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the, name, the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, so the Antichrist will be a man, and his number is 666. It's not just three separate sixes with a dash in between. So this number is like 666. So I still believe that if you do Hebrew gematria, uh, each letter in the Hebrew Bible has a numerical value, like the name David, Dawid, those three consonants add up to 14. So this, you, you will, the, the Antichrist is not hiding anything. His name will add up to 666. I have already checked all of you. You're okay. That's part of becoming a member here. Let's, we got to do your, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> if your name adds up to 666, we have to, well, we'll witness to you and then kick you out. So I, th I think it'll be so clear who he is, and he'll, I think he wants people to know, uh, and then watch, people will still worship him. So the lake of fire is mentioned in this text. Notice it says, both the Antichrist and the false prophet were seized and then thrown alive in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Now, I'm going to make a point of this, because do you have the word seized at the beginning? And then the word throne. What tenses are those? Yeah, we're dealing with Bible prophecy, which is still future, and they're put in a past tense. So remember, in the Greek language, you have an aorist tense. usually describes past action. But sometimes you have what's called the proleptic aorist, which describes a, a, a future event is so certain to happen that it's put in a past tense. I think that's what's going on here. I mean, the Antichrist and the false prophet have not been thrown into the lake of fire now. And some will try to do this with this past tense language and say that it's already happened and all that. I don't believe that at all. So the lake of fire into which they're cast is a location of the final judgment of all unbelievers. But it's also the final destiny of Satan and all fallen angels. So Revelation 20, 11 through 15, which will be studying soon, shows that this is the same location for all unsaved people of history. Matthew 25, 41 says Satan and his fallen angels will be there as well. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus will say to those on his left, those are the goats, remember the sheep and the goats, those are Gentile believer versus unbeliever. So he'll say to the goats, the unsaved people, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. But then he says, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So somehow, well, I know for sure, earlier in history, Satan had fallen and talked one-third of the angels to follow him in his unholy rebellion. That's why I think in Revelation 12 when it says, I saw the dragon and his tail swept a third of the stars from heaven. Stars often indicate angels. So I think there's a one-third amount of, a one-third number of angels that followed Satan. 
So the rest, how many more do we have? Please help me. I mean, I went to elementary school, so (laughs) two-thirds. I'm terrible. I make jokes about math because if we had to do math to get into heaven, I might as well give up now. I loved English and grammar and stuff, and maybe that's what attracted me to the Greek and the Hebrew stuff. Anyway, we have the greater number, right? (laughs) We have two-thirds of the angels on our side, and we have the triune God on our side, so we cannot lose. But Satan and the fallen angels will be in the same location, Matthew 25, 41. We know that Satan will actually be seized after Christ's return. An angel will grab him, put him in a, in a sealed abyss for a thousand years. He cannot get out. Until the thousand years are over, he's let out. Then he does the Magog, Gog and Magog revolution and brings the enemies of God against Jerusalem. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes it. And then Satan will then go into the lake of fire, Revelation 20.10. So he he goes into a holding cell waiting for that. But is he alive and well now? There's theologies now that say Satan is bound. Because they're trying to pull this all-millennial view that we're in the millennium now. No, no. Satan's not bound until Christ returns to earth and then begins his thousand-year reign. Because if Satan is bound, how do you explain 1 Peter 5.8 that calls him a roaring lion that's seeking somebody to devour now? So they say, well, there's one arm tied behind his back. No, Revelation 20 says, he was thrown in the abyss, it was sealed over him, he cannot get out. he's, He's grabbed with a great chain. Well, so that means a a hand tied behind his back? I don't think so. Bible prophecy and the way you interpret it matters. Amen? It's going to change the way you live life, the way you look at history, the way you look at the future. So read it carefully. So Satan's global agenda through his evil world dominance, as it's being built now, will one day all come crashing down at the end of the seven-year tribulation when Christ returns to demolish it. And this global agenda started when? At the signing of the covenant? No. After the fall of man. Didn't didn't Satan know that a a Messiah is coming to crush his head? Genesis 3.15. Didn't he build the Tower of Babel to go against God in Genesis 11? What did God do there? Squashed it. Scattered everybody. Now there'll be a global Tower of Babel, if you will. Babylon will be rebuilt, Revelation 17 and 18. And according to the first part of chapter 19, it all goes down. The whole thing comes crashing down like a house of cards, because that's all it is. It's built on nothing but evil. And that's going away. Amen? I mean, I hope we have a heart for the unbeliever that we once were. Shouldn't you witness to them so that they don't go through the judgment? Yes. But we can't wait for Jesus to come back to end it all. Hopefully that's what you want. I am glad he waited till I was a little older than 26 because that's when I came to faith. (laughs) You know, so you got to think about the unbeliever, but there will be unbelievers that will refuse even after hearing the message. Did I tell you I'd finish the chapter? Who scoffed at me? Oh, Jane? (laughs) That was a joke at the beginning of the service. 1921, the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and that's Jesus. And there's not a literal sword that he uses. I think it's his word. It just speaks and it happens. He speaks and it happens. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. I I had to close with this principle. I added this. You may send me over in a minute or two. You know, when Jesus came at his first advent, he emphasized turning the other cheek, didn't he? To someone who resists you. And then let him smite the other. So turn your cheek and smite. He does talk about judgment in the Sermon on the Mount at the end of chapter 7. He who doesn't keep my words is like a house built on sand. 
So judgment's there, but he does speak a lot about turning the cheek and letting them smite you. Isn't that what they did, what he did? At his trial, according to Isaiah 50, it prophesied that they would pull out the Messiah's beard. Isaiah 50, 700 years before, said they would abuse the Messiah by pulling out his beard. So we know at least Jesus was a man and he had facial hair. That's what it tells you. I don't know how long his hair was on his head, but... So he let them do that, right? Because he didn't come to set up the kingdom and smite the nations. He came to lay down his life. So he speaks of turning the other cheek to Israel in the Sermon on the Mount. Let him smite the other, Matthew 5, 39. But when Jesus returns at his second advent, he will smite the cheek, of, as, it, as it were, of his enemies. Doesn't it say in 1915, he will strike the nations? He'll smite the nations in order to end evil on this earth and establish peace. It's the only way it'll come. So I thought I'd close today with Psalm 3. You can turn there. By the way, who wrote Psalm 3? You, you, if you guess, you'll probably get it right. King David. David writes a lot of the Psalms. Now, when Psalm 3 is written, it's written... Um, about the life of David, and David writes this seven-verse poem when he's going through problems with his son Absalom. Remember, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah, uh, God said, I'm not going to kill you through the prophet Nathan. I won't kill you, but you will. the sword will never pass from your house. And so his own son Absalom pulls this revolt against his father. It was horrible. David just ached over that because it was his own son. As bad as it was for him, he still loved his son. And so David writes this psalm based on that occasion. But remember, David is the king who will have a line that will bring in the ultimate king, Jesus, from the tribe of Judah. God gave him the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. He says, the one in your line will be an ultimate king who will rule an eternal kingdom over an eternal dynasty on an eternal throne over an eternal kingdom. So look what David writes. Now, if Jesus says, turn the other cheek and let him smite the other, what do you do with this? Which I think in that context, he meant that in Matthew 5. But David writes in Psalm 3, 1, O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Now, again, it's the time of Absalom. Don't you have that in the post? In the, in the, the words above the psalm are actually in the Hebrew. So that's the occasion with Absalom. But isn't there application for this ultimately through Messiah and his enemies? So David says, many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my life or my soul, there's no deliverance from him and God. But you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. Can't we pray this? And thank God for being that deliverer and shield. Hey, you made it here another week. I saw you last Sunday. You're still on earth. Who do you praise? Your lucky stars? No, you praise the God who created the stars. I love that in Genesis 1 when he's creating. Oh, and he made the stars too. Like, like, like that, that was finger work. No, no big deal. So the creator of the universe is the one we have who's our shield, our glory, and the one who lifts our head. David says, I was crying to Yahweh with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. So when you woke up this morning, who do you praise? The Lord. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Now here it is, verse 7. And I highlighted it in yellow. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. What kind of salvation? Isn't David a child of God? Yes. So what kind of deliverance? A physical deliverance from the enemy. Just like Isaiah 63 and Zephaniah, I think it was 317. The Lord is a, a warrior who saves. But isn't David a warrior? <laughs> Not the ultimate warrior. He still needed help. And here's what he says in the middle. For you, that's Yahweh, the Lord, the Savior, you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. 
wait a minute, turn the other cheek and let him strike you. So isn't God a cheek smiter? And look at the second half. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. So God is a cheek smiter and a teeth smasher. Are you reading this? So when he says, turn the other cheek, he's dealing with something specific to Israel at his first advent. And I think it's Lamentations 3. Because Lamentations 3 says, when Israel comes under the bondage of a foreign power because they sinned, he says, you need to put your face in the dust and let them smite you on the other cheek. Let them smite you on the cheek. Give them the other one. That's Lamentations 3. So when Jesus came to earth, he, they were under the domination of Rome. It wasn't their time to fight. If they would accept Messiah, he would fight for them and be the teeth smasher and the cheek smiter. And there's also an application of not resisting somebody, and I understand that as well in the Sermon on the Mount. So David says he looks at God as a cheek smiter and a teeth smasher of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. So the Lord, or Yahweh, was a savior to King David and did so by smiting his enemies on the cheek and shattering their teeth. Jesus Christ, the ultimate king in the line of David, will one day do the same when he returns to smash the enemy on a global scale. Okay, so Old Testament God, God of grace, love and grace, right? Exodus 34, 6, also a God of judgment. During his first advent, God of grace, God of judgment. During the church, God of grace, God of judgment. Second advent, God of grace. How many years did he give them to turn? Seven. Over and over, they, he kept doing these disasters on earth so that they would turn to him, but they kept resisting. God of grace, but also a God of judgment. So, <clears throat> as we close this chapter this morning, is God a God of grace or a God of judgment? Yes. Dr. Walvoord said this. I like his comment, who was a prophecy scholar from Dallas Seminary, who died, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. A great prophecy scholar, very well known for his work in the book of Revelation. He said, the same inspired word of God, which so wonderfully describes the grace of God and the salvation which is available to all who believe, is equally plain about the judgment of all who reject the grace of God. The tendency of liberal, liberal interpreters of the Bible to emphasize passages dealing with the love of God and to ignore passages dealing with His righteous judgment is completely unjustified. The passages on judgment are just as inspired and accurate as those which develop the doctrines of grace and salvation. The Bible is clear that judgment awaits the wicked, and the second coming of Christ is the occasion for a worldwide judgment unparalleled in Scripture since the time of Noah's flood. So there's a balance there. There's a God of grace and judgment in both Testaments, but Jesus ends history with the worst violence you've ever seen and then brings in a kingdom of peace because that was the necessary way. So as we close, if a person wants to avoid eternal judgment, a human being, eternal divine judgment, he has to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior if he's never done so. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 describes the gospel of the good news this way. For I delivered to you of, as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, Christ being eternal God who became flesh and went to the cross. He was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Do you believe that? Have you ever believed that? Well, you better because John 3.18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. So if you've ever believed in Jesus Christ, your condemnation has been removed. But then it says, he who does not believe has been or stands judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So if Jesus Christ died for your sins, all of them, and you reject that only payment God gave us for sin, 
then you remain in condemnation. You stand judged already. The wrath of God continues to abide on you, John 3.36. But it will be lifted in a heartbeat if you'll believe in His Son. John 5.24, He who believes in Him will not come under judgment, but has been passed from death into life. And I think that's most of you, because I know most of you in here. So go out and give the good news to somebody. Because judgment is here, but it's going to get really bad. And if people miss that rapture, they're going to be in a world of hurt in that seven years. So we need to be given the good news of Jesus. And even if it was the greatest peacetime on the globe, do we still need to give the gospel? <laughs> Being unsaved is unsaved. Um, eternal judgment's coming, no matter what. So let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we come before you humbly, thanking you for all you've done for us. And as we look at this second advent of Christ, historically speaking from the scripture, it's a long time in waiting, waiting for that seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. And all through biblical history, this whole event has been anticipated where Jesus Christ will war with Antichrist, Satan against the Lord, the Holy Trinity versus the Unholy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit versus Satan, Beast, and False Prophet. And Lord, we know who wins, and we had no doubt that you would. You're the eternal, living, powerful God, all-powerful God Almighty. And we thank you that we're in your hands, that after believing in Jesus Christ, we are your sheep you give us eternal life, we will never perish forever, and nothing can pluck us out of your hand. Thank you, Lord, for holding us in your mighty grip. So, Lord, we pray for this world. We just pray that the gospel will continue to go out globally, everywhere in every way possible, so that people can hear the good news and believe in Jesus Christ and be spared eternal judgment. So, Lord, we pray for all of those who are about your business, serving you as disciples and giving the good news of Jesus everywhere. But Lord, that means we all need to be doing it. No matter what scale we do it on, even witnessing to one person is important. And may we do that. In Jesus, we, his precious name we pray, amen.